right, so this is the Lightroom developing workshop. And as you can see, we're already in Lightroom here and we're in the library module. We had set this up and brought these photos in as part of the library workshop. And so you can see here on the left side of the screen in the, in the left panel, we have our navigator, depending on which photo we're selected here. And our catalog, we have 15 photos, no quick collections. And they come from four different folders. So we have these different folders and you can see how many photos are from each folder. We have a couple of collections that we made. So you can see where those are. There's, there's the flowers and then another collection called insects. Go back to all photos. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna um, go into the develop module and start to work on some of these photos and just use some examples so that we can run through uh, what's happening here on the, on the right, right side of the screen, the right panel. So now let's switch over to development mode. And there's a photo that we have selected and we're gonna go back and unselect them, edit, select none. And so now we have just a blank screen here in the image area. And you can see over here that um, this has changed, right? We don't have our um, all photos on our catalogs. Instead, we have presets, which are different ways of developing your photos, filters also called, or actions. Snapshots. Snapshots is when you're working on a photo, you can stop at any one time and, and grab it. And then if you work on it some more, you can go back and see what that snapshot looks like. Your history will show you all of the different actions that you've taken on any one of your photos as part of developing. And then down here, we still have collections. So we can still get to some of our photos and see which ones that we had set aside. If you want to get to all of our photos, we've got to go all the way down here to the bottom. And this is where we can get into all photographs. So there's all our photos again. Or if we wanted to, if we had some uh, one folder, people. So we can just show the people. So we can still get into our catalog. We can still look at what's available in the library over here on the left panel. It's just down at the bottom of the screen instead. So let's get back to all photos folder all photos. So here they are. And what we're going to do is we're going to start to work through all these different photos and some of the functions that we have in here. So let's start out with just the viewer itself. And at the bottom of the viewer, there's several different icons. And the first icon is the look view. There's no grid view, so you can't look at all the grid here. You can only see the thumbnails at the bottom of the screen. Right next to the loop view is a reference view. So if I wanted to compare two dogs here, so I'll select this dog. And then I want to compare other dogs to them. I can hit this. And there's a dog selected there. Maybe I want to select this one. Maybe I want to select this one. So that's a way of, of comparing photos. And this is kind of handy when, say, you have one photo and you want to match uh, the color or, or the exposure. Just have two photos look a lot alike. So that's, that's reference. The other thing that we have here, why, why, it's a before and after. 
So if I were to be working on this photo, if I say I lightened it, I can see what the photo looked like before and after. So you can always go back and compare your photo to what it looked like originally. Let's reset that. And let's go back into loop view. The other thing that's down here in the bottom is what's called soft proofing. And the idea of soft proofing is to give you an idea how this is going to look when you make a print. And so if we click on it, you're going to notice two things. One, we're going to get a white border, and then we're going to get some information up here in the upper right corner of the screen. So we'll go to soft proofing. And as you can see up here, there's different profiles that we could apply. Uh, this is an sRGB, which is a pretty standard color profile, Adobe RGB, or there might be other. You might actually have a, a profile that you want to put in so that you can see how the photo is going to look. It's pretty advanced, has a lot to do with, with printing. So if you have your own printer or you have a, a good lab that has a color profile, this is the place where you can see how it's going to look. Let's go back to our loop view. And then we can also unselect this. Two ways of unselecting it is up to the edit, select none. Or I can just, and I'm on a Mac, so I can do Command D. And now it's not selected anymore. I'll go back to this guy. I like to have this dog staring at us. We also have our filters at the bottom right corner. And right now there's no filters. You can see it says no filter at the bottom corner here. And there's a little toggle where I can turn that filter on, turn that filter off. And you can see it'll light up when it's on and it's grayed out when it's off. So I don't have much in the way of, of rating or anything for these photos, but I do have two of them that are colored. And so if I turn the filter on, which is on, and, and these are green, I can just show the, the photos with the green label. And if I click on that, these are the only two photos that have the green label. So if we want to take the labels off of them, we can remove them, set color label to none. And we did this before, set color label to none. Uh oh, now we don't have anything here. So we'll turn off our, our filter. And if we wanted to filter one of these things, we have to do it the same way. Set rating, set color label. It's not quite as easy as in the library, but most functions are cross-referenceable, so you can do it in the different modules. All right, let's select a different photo here. And I'm gonna select this one. Because I want to talk about the histogram. So our histogram is pretty similar in appearance at first to what it looks like in the library. Let's switch over to the library module. So here in the library module, we have our photo. Let's go into loop view. And there's the, the histogram. And if I go in develop mode, same histogram because it's the same photo but as we toggle back and forth we can see that there are some differences so let's let's look at what these differences are and the two ones that are stand out right away are the little triangles in the upper corners and what these triangles do is they show us the areas that are clipped and in other words they're pixels that have gone off scale 
So on the right hand side are pixels that have gone off scale in terms of brightness. And then on the left are pixels that have gone off scale in terms of darkness or blackness. And right now, the, there are none that are off scale in terms of black, but we have some that are off scale in terms of, of whiteness. So it's right here where the sun is. And if we click on this triangle, then they show up in red. And if we unclick it, and if we just hover over it, it also shows up in red. So we can see where we've gone um, beyond. This could be really handy, especially if you're doing pictures of people and there might be parts of their face which is off scale, so you know that it's just not recoverable. Now this area in the here looks like it's black, but when we hover over the black clipping triangle, nothing shows up. So we've got data in here. And as if we were to, to lighten this up a lot, we would start to see that texture in there. And then you can start to see the texture in the tree. If we go the other direction, and we hover over here, we've introduced some black. So we're starting to go off scale here. Let's make it real dark. There we go. Now, as we go darker and darker, you can start to see how much that's been clipped. So we forced it. And having gone this far, there's nothing that's clipped on the other side. So this is an extreme example. Uh, let's hit the reset. So, so there's our clipping. And those are, those are pretty handy. Uh, you can leave them on or you can turn them off, which is fine. Now, other thing about the histogram in the develop mode is, and this is very subtle, that there are five zones. And if you were in your own computer, you might be able to see this, that as I hover over different parts of the histogram, I get different areas that are highlighted. So when I'm right here in the middle, those are my midtones. So all these pixels here are considered midtone. When I come over here, I'm in the shadows. And when I come to the far end, I'm in the blacks. And then here are highlights and here are my whites. And as I move between these two, or um, these three, I suppose, or five, one, two, three, four, five, You'll notice down here, the sliders start to light up too. They, they correspond to each other. So if I'm here in the, in the midtones, the exposure slider lights up. And if I come down here and hover over the exposure slider, then the area of the histogram that corresponds to it goes into a light, kind of a light gray up here too. So you see how that works? And there's also, it's kind of, that histogram is active. So if I'm up here in the, the midtones, and if you notice, I have a double-headed arrow. So down here I have an arrow, but up here I have a double-headed arrow. So I can actually start to change the exposure just by dragging the histogram back and forth. Looks like it's sloshing around in there, doesn't it? So we have it, we have this ability to to just just grab our histogram and make adjustments, or we can do it from the slider. So it does it does the same thing. And the midtone or exposure slider has the most effect. It, it affects the whole photograph most noticeably. All the sliders tend to affect the whole photograph, but less so. So if I'm up here in, in the highlights and I start to drag them around, you can see there's a little bit of, a, of an effect of the midtones, but less of an effect on the shadows. 
I, I hardly move around at all. If I leave that there and I come over here to the say to the blacks and I start to move those blacks around, the whites and the highlights are less effective, but the midtones are effective. And you can see down the slider is magically moving back and forth, even though I'm not touching it. So let's let's hit reset. So that's, that's our, our histogram, and it tells us a lot about our photo. We've talked about histograms um, at other times. And so you can see that the luminosity is, is the gray. Those are the, are the pixels that fall in the different zones. And then it also has the, the various colors, the red, you see red and yellow and blue up here. So there's a lot blue, you can see the blue up in this area. So now let's talk about color balance. And I'm gonna select another photograph for color balance. And let's go to Asbury Park. So here's, here's Asbury Park. So here's a shot that was taken inside the casino at Asbury, sort of an open walkway. And the color is a little bit off. I had my camera on uh, auto white balance, but I'm not really that happy, you know, with the with the color that it gave me. So, so what I want to do is I want to I want to change my color balance, and that's pretty straightforward. We have a dropper, and with our dropper, wherever we put it it's going to assume that that area that we picked is supposed to be white or gray, actually gray. Everything is gray. And what it'll do, it'll set all the other pixels relative to the area that we picked. And so this looks like it's pretty white, the guy's shirt or jacket maybe. And if I click on that, cannot set the white balance because it's too bright. So I'll have to pick a darker area. And so any any gray tone is fine. This his cup has gray tones. And the back of his shirt has gray tones. And you can tell that the area that I'm hovering over is shown in the in the little thumbnail. So that's pretty blue. So when I hit this, I bet you this is really going to warm up. So it sure did. Yeah, that warmed up quite a bit. If I were to select a different area, say this cup, I might get different results. It's even warmer. So I like to start off with clicking on a, on a white area and then tweaking it. And what I like, because I'm I'm always interested interested in good skin tones, and and his skin tones aren't too bad. This might be a little yellow, so I might bring down the yellow a little bit. And a lot's going to have to do with your monitor. How accurate is your monitor, or how does it relate to the prints that you have made? So that's always kind of a tough call, and this is. Very subjective. There are, you know, um, quantitatively there are there are color balances, but colors all over the place. And there's a lot of spectrum, and there's reflective colors, different light sources at the same time, and so how you want your photo to look is up to you. And really, we're just looking at at three colors. We're looking at blue, yellow, green, and magenta. And, and I find that as I up my magenta a little bit, um, things tend to get a little, they just seem to look a little sharper to me. That might have to do with uh, the sensitivity of the eye to red. So you just play with that to get that to work. So that's a pretty straightforward and easy thing to do. Now, if we start to move down 
the scale down in here, this is where we're starting to get back into the color. So when we get down here into what we call presence, there's texture, clarity, dehaze, vibrance, and saturation. So texture is pretty much more of a sharpening. Let's get out the out there. So if I, if I zoom in, he's a little, a little fuzzy. Uh, the woman in the picture behind him is pretty sharp. But as I add texture, it's a subtle sharpening. So as I slide this back and forth, you can see how, how it changes just ever so slightly. So it's not, it's not overwhelming. And then clarity provides more of an overall punch to the photo. And so these are, these are sliders that we can um, pretty much easily overdo, uh, especially clarity. So as I drag my clarity slider more and more to the right, the photo takes on a, a real edgy kind of almost, almost metallic look to it. So the person doesn't look too good. This picture behind the person looks fine because it was sort of fuzzy to start with. But you can see how that, that affects the individual that's in the photo. And then one of my favorites is the dehaze slider. And the haze or dehaze amplifies the color and contrast in areas where the photo is a little bit washed out. I find this especially useful when I'm shooting into the sun. I have my, my small camera that I carry around all the time doesn't have a lens hood. So it's not unusual that I get a little bit of, of flare on my lens and the, the, the haze or dehaze really helps with that. And for this photo, if I were to bump up the dehaze, you can see how it starts to sharpen that background and take that fuzziness out of the photo. And it's very subtle. So I've, I've used dehaze a lot for many of my photos, but it doesn't have that same impact that clarity does where clarity may make our photos look a little bit over-processed. that back to zero. The dehaze is just, just a little bit more subtle. Right? So if I bring this all the way back to a reset, and then I just play with the dehaze, it's just that slider alone can make some improvements on your photo. Like I say, it's real good for, for backlit photos when we get a little bit of hazing from the, from the backlight. It can actually save a photo that otherwise you wouldn't be able to use. And then of course the vibrance and saturation have a big impact on, on the color. That's what those two are all about. I'm not sure if this is the best photo for that. Let's pick another photo. Let's pick, uh, this is EJ. And so if I increase the vibrance of this photo, you can see how it's starting to actually, it gives it most, most of the yellowish tone to it. And I find that saturation does that too. As I saturate my photos, they tend to start to lean yellow in which case then I come back up to the temperature and I bring it back down. So saturation and temperature often are, are used in tandem. 
And you can see how that, that made a difference. I, I increase the saturation and then I lower the K value to make that work. And I'm going to reset this again. So if I were to, um, let's see, that was at 5100. So that's a good way of being able to um, play with your photos. And then vibrance and clarity are both, you know, nice sliders just to play with up and down. I'm sure both of you have, have done that. So let's start looking at our tools. All right, so these are our tools up here. And let's, um, let's switch over to another photo here. So the six tools are our crop, spot, red eye, graduated filter, radio filter, and brush. So crop is easy to understand. And, and crop allows us to zoom into a certain part of the picture and eliminate other parts. So if we hit our crop tool, we're immediately provided with some grid lines. So this is sort of the rule of thirds here. And there's a couple of ways of cropping. One is by hitting the aspect button and we can just drag inside of our photo and decide where we want to crop. And then we hit done. And there's our crop. So that was pretty straightforward. We hit the crop tool and we hit aspect. And then just drag where we want to crop. And if you notice, it's sort of jumping back and forth. And that's because our crop is locked. So we have the lock tool. If we unlock this, then we're able to, to move and crop in, in any form what we, that we want to. Otherwise, it's going to stay with the same aspect ratio that the photo was in. And this photo and all my photos are, are shot you know, right out of the camera. They're in, in a 2x3, 4x6, 8x12 aspect ratio and so if my little padlock is locked and if I just grab the corner to do my cropping it's going to stay at that aspect ratio so if you're having prints made and they're going to be four by six you're going to want to crop ahead of time so you know what your photo is going to look like and if you grab the corner and just to kind of give it a little back and forth tweak with your mouse, it'll toggle between the portrait mode and, and landscape mode. So yeah, that just jumps back and forth. And that does in the, in the aspect, when we're using the aspect tool, you probably saw that before, as, as I changed it, it would go back and forth between the, the different props. See how I go back and forth. And there's my little doggy. So I'll reset that. Now, if I don't want a four by six, I can also select other aspect ratios. I can make it square with a one to one. Or if I'm shooting five by sevens, or if I want to do an eight by 12, here's a, a five by seven. If I want to go eight by 10. So this is very handy. And you can also enter a custom. So let's say you're going to do, um, I don't know, eight and a half by 11. By 11. You know, you're going to print it out on a printer on a, on a piece of regular paper. Then there you go. Now you have an eight and a half by 11 aspect ratio. And that's what it's going to look like when you print it on your printer. Hit done.
I don't know, soft earthen. There we go. You're not pretty. So we reset that. I'm a I'm a big fan of cropping. I crop almost all my photos to a certain point. Out in the real world, I cannot necessarily get the shot that I'm going for. And I find cropping to be pretty useful. We can also change our angle. So if, if we're a little crooked, but it only change it within the context of the frame. So if you're not really well cropped in, you can't tilt it too much. So if I were, if I'm, if I'm zoomed back here, let's say reset this. And if I want to just crop that much and try to change the angle, uh, I, it makes the crop smaller and smaller as I change the angle, because it's going to stay within the bounds. And we'll reset that. And then there's one more thing called constraint to image. And that's related to the upright tool, which is down here at the bottom. And we'll, we're going to look at that uh, in a little bit, because we're going to be doing it with the photo uh, the, of the building. So just remember that constraint to image. And that doesn't really have much effect when we're uh, in here, because we're already constrained to the image. So there's there's no white area outside this, so that's that's our area. So now let's look at the um, the spot removal tool, and let's uh, let's change to a different photo here. I'm still in crop, so I'm going to remove the crop tool. And right next to it is the spot removal. And spot removal has three variables. The size, and you can see there's, there's the little spot removal tool as I slide it back and forth. The size of the spot removal changes. How much feathering is around the outside. So feathering is sort of the gradual spot removal so that it's not as obvious. And then of course, opacity. Is it 100% spot removal or you're just reducing an area? And so these three variables are gonna give you more control. Uh, spot removal is great for blemishes. And I don't have a lot in here. Maybe I wanna get rid of some of this stuff in the back here. So I'm gonna I just adjust my spot removal tool to about the size of that spot there. And right now I have it set to, uh, I'll put it to 100. And I have a certain amount of feathering. And I, when I click on it, it just randomly selects an area. So Adobe just, Adobe engineers designed it so that it looks for an area that you think is going to be just right. And then you just grab that to move it around to whatever you want to be in that spot. So if I put it up here, and now I've, I've gotten rid of that little area in there. Another thing that we can do with the spot tool is get linear things. So we have this pipe up here. If I want to get rid of that pipe, I can go in the spot removal and instead of just clicking in one area, I can drag it. And so as I drag it, see it's picked an area for me. And so now I've, I've kind of gotten rid of that pipe. It's a little, um, a little sloppy here at the bottom, but I can add another one. Maybe add a smaller one. And, and drag that along the bottom there. And move this over here. Yeah, 
it's a little bit of a crude tool, but it's good for spots, not good for um, real fine tune cropping. It doesn't work as well as a selection tool in Photoshop, but we're not in Photoshop. At least it gives us something. And as I mentioned, it's real good for blemishes. If your subject has some blemishes or if there's some little things in the background you want to get rid of. It can also work well if there's a, a dust problem inside your camera and that same spot shows up in all the photos, you can, you can spot that out. And then if we want to move it, we just make it active and these are, are called our pins. So that gray, when I click on a pin and it turns black, that means that it, it's active. And so I can move this around. And then here's the other pin. It's just difficult to select because it's underneath this other one. Oops, I just made another one. So I'm not going to be able to grab this one because it's underneath that other one. So that's something to, to keep in mind. And then cloning and healing are pretty close. Cloning tends to, to be more specific. And then healing tends to sort of um, bring in the color and the texture, but not make it exact. Now the next one is a red eye tool. And I don't have any of my own photos that have red eye. Uh, I think that a lot of our cameras now are, and our flashes are designed to minimize red eye through various things. An off camera flash will minimize red eye. So, but just to show you how it works, uh, I'm going to grab a photo. I grabbed the photo off the internet. And there's our red eye. And if you're familiar with red eye, you know that it's the flash going through the pupil and lighting up the blood vessels in the back of the eye. And because of the angle of the lens and the way the light goes in and comes straight back out, we're able to see those blood vessels. And so the red eye tool is just a little kind of target. You can see the target here. And I can change the size of it. And I'm doing this with my scroller on my mouse. So I'm, I want to make this about the size of the eye. So that looks like that's about right. And I just click on it. And it, and it fills in the pupil. It, it finds the red and neutralizes it and darkens it. It's a good opportunity to show a cloning tool. Let's do some healing on this little pimple here. Just for fun. This kid has a pimple. Let's get rid of it. So I'm going to make that a little bigger. We got some nice feather. And not only have we taken out one of his red eyes, we've gotten rid of some, one of his pimples. So enough of this photo. These three tools, the, the graduated filter and the radial filter and the brush are all very similar, but they have their own unique characteristics. And one of the things that you'll notice is as I, as I click on any one of them, their controls are very similar to our, the controls, our overall controls of our photo. So if I, if I turn this off completely, so none of my tools is selected and, and these are my sliders, temperature, tint, exposure, contrast, and so on. And if I click on any one of these tools, you can see that this drops down and I have pretty much the same sliders. Over here, as I, as I scroll down, 
These are the controls for my overall photo. And these are the controls for my tools. And one of the problems that I find with this is they look really a lot alike. And I may find myself looking at my overall photo and thinking, well, I want to make this whole thing darker. And so I'll start to drag the exposure down and, and nothing's happening. So no matter how much I move this slider, the, the picture's just staying the same. And it's like, well, what's up with that? And then I realized that one of my tools is selected. And so you can see I dragged this all the way down to negative 3.56 and nothing happened, but my tools, it's lit up. And so if I click on it again, it's not lit. And now I can see, oh, all right. So now that's, that's how that works. Now, why, one of the things that I did, and I want, that's why I did it this way, is when I played around and I accidentally had my tool selected, when I changed it, and this will be for any of these tools, it stayed at that negative number and all of them. So it, it kind of stuck there. And if I come in here and I wanna put a gradient filter in and I start to drag it from the corner, it automatically starts out with that last setting that I put in there. And, and rarely do I want that. Usually I wanna put my tool in here first and then start to make my adjustments. So that's something to, to be aware of. And how do we get rid of that? Well, the only way to get rid of it and to sort of loosen it up so that this doesn't happen is you have to select a tool, make the changes without actually putting anything in the photo. So I, I don't have a gradient filter drawn on the photo. And now I'm gonna exit out of my tool. And then, then if I go back into it, let's say we go back into it, it's been corrected. Now it's back to zero. So now I'm gonna start off with this gradient tool. And this is more of a linear tool, sort of a straight line. And if I were to start here on the left side of the photo and drag across, I get three lines and a pin right in the middle. And the middle line is where I can I change the angle of it. So I can change this angle back and forth. And then the pin, I can grab the pin and move it around. And I can grab the far line and I can compress it. So we move this guy around, we rotate it. And my intent here is to darken the wall. So I'm gonna come up and I'm gonna go to exposure and I'm gonna drag the exposure down. And it changes the histogram a little bit. And then I can fine tune it, maybe make it a little bit more gradual. And, and there we just sort of vignetted that corner a little bit. And we can, we have certain amount of controls over here in terms of the, um, the exposure, texture, sharpness, very much like what we saw with the other overall photo controls. And then we have the range mask and we'll turn that on. And so you can see that that actually shows it up or makes it so that it doesn't happen. So that's changing that. And if I hover over the pin, the area that's been affected is pink. Right? And so it's only showing up when I'm hovering. 
And it also show up if I click this checkbox down at the bottom, show selected area mask overlay. And if I click on this, now it stays on, whether I'm hovering over it or not. And this could be useful if, if you wanted to sort of play with the area that you wanted to affect before applying any of the adjustments. So, and then you can just turn that back off. So that's one way of seeing where your adjustments are gonna be made without having to make any of the adjustments. Now that I've put this gradient tool in the photo, and if I exit out of it, the next time that I go into this tool, the exposure isn't, isn't changed because it's assuming that I want to create a new tool. In order to, to adjust this area that we did before, I have to click on the pin and now I can see the exposure adjustments that I made. And while I'm here, I can just create a new one right from the beginning. And then maybe I want to grab, grab one over here in the corner. So I can create another one over on this side. I can make it darker. Now the next tool is our radial tool. And that's this, the circular one. And as you can see, while we're moving our, our way around here, if we look at the history, Look at all the things that we've done to this photo so far. But we can go back to any one of these, any one of these areas, and, and it takes us back, back in history, back in time. So we can see any adjustments that we've made. And if we're, we're happy so far with what we've done, you know, we're up to this point, this might be where we might want to make a snapshot. So we could just make a quick snapshot and it's dated by the, by the time that we've made it. So if I create that, now I have a snapshot of, of what this looks like now. And as I start to work on it, I can go back to this point. I don't have to scroll through my history and try and figure out at what point did I have a picture that I was happy with. So moving on, let's take a look at our radial tool. So I turn that off. You can see we're back here with just the regular sliders. And I put that on and our radial tool is just that. It's, it's a, a circular or oval shaped mask. And I start to drag it. And I'm dragging it over his face. And I have four handles. So if I want to shape this to his face, I can narrow it so it's not a circle, but more of an oval. And then any one of these handles, I can grab and I can rotate them. Right, so his head is on a little bit of a tilt. And so I'm going to want to make my radial tool fit him as well as possible. And one thing that, oops, I lost my pen, there it is. Lightroom doesn't have a square tool. It only has a circular. So any, any kind of you know, adjustments that we're gonna make uh, are, aren't gonna have sharp edges. They're gonna be rounded edges. So in here, I want to adjust his color as the, it's a little too blue. There's some daylight coming in on him. So I want to make that a little warmer. And I come up here to the temperature and we've lost our Kelvin scale. And now we're just yellow and blue. And then the tint's pretty much the same. So I just want to make this a little bit more yellow. You see how that improves the skin tone? So now his skin is more brown than blue, which is much more natural. 
And if I want to make a, a, a copy of this, I can work on the inside or I can actually work on the outside through the invert. So there's inside. I'm down here at the bottom where it says invert. And if I unclick the checkbox, it affects the outside of the circle. And if I click it, it does the inside. And so often, I was going to say sometimes, but pretty often all, all there's is together. I'll, I'll want to work on both the inside and the outside. And what I'll do in order to do that is I'll hover on my pin and I'll right click and I'll duplicate it. So now I actually have two radial tools. And you can see as I move it around, you can see where that color adjustment was made. And so maybe for the outside, I'll offset my pin so I can grab them. I'm going to go to the outside, but I don't want the color to be wrong. I'm going to put the color back to where it was, but maybe I want it darker so that his face stands out a little bit more. And then I can make it a little larger. And I can also feather it. So if I don't feather it at all, you can see I get a hard line. And if I feather it a lot, then I get a nice soft graduated look. And, and this is kind of helpful to adjust and, and to draw your viewer's attention into the area of the photo that uh, you feel is, um, most important. And I, you know, I, I think this man's face is more important than, you know, some of that background. So, so that's a nice way of doing a little bit of dodging and burning on your photo using our radial tool. And now let's say we want to take a look to see what this looks like beforehand. We come down here we have the before and after. And if we click on this icon, it says why, why? Now we can see what the photo looked like originally. So on the right or on the left hand side, we have the original photo. And then on the left, we have the photo that we started to work on. So that's pretty handy. And there's different ways of looking at it. Um, there's top and bottom, before and after. So you can oops, zoom back and forth in here. And then put them there. Before and after, left and right. That's what I like. Let's get out of this back in for a loop view. Lost it. And we've gone back to the original. So let's jump back to our snapshot. That's pretty handy. <clears throat> At some point, we hit revert settings. And see our history here? So let's go back here. Now, <clears throat> this is where we left off. I must have hit the, the reset button and accidentally cleared everything out. But fortunately, I have the history. And I also have the snapshot of places that we worked at. So I can go back to where we were. So, saved. So here we are. Uh, we've got kind of a nice gradient. The face is brighter than the background. Maybe overall it's a little too dark. So I might want to lighten it up a little bit. 
but I still like this comparison of, of having uh, the man's face a little brighter. And then the next thing I might want to work on are his hands. You know, because his hands are still a little blue. And the radial tool isn't going to quite work on his hands because his hands are more in the shape of a triangle. And, and if I, you know, I scrunch this, I'm not able to really get this in the shape of a triangle. So I'm going to delete it. So if we zoom in on our hand, we can see that, um, you know, they're, they're very irregular shape, and this is perfect for the brush tool. And that's our last tool over here, so we'll grab that. And as we click on it, we can see the different controls, similar to the other two tools that we were just looking at. And then there's also two different kinds of brushes, an A brush, a B brush, and there's an erase, which is real handy. So I'm going to start to work on this man's hand, and I'm going to adjust it, make the size about the size of his fingers. And in order to see where I'm working, uh, I'm going to turn on the mask overlay. And so I just want to get his fingers without getting too much else. And even as I'm here, I'm going to make this smaller and get the top fingers. Make it even smaller. So I can change the size of the brush as, as I'm going forward. So I'm going to zoom out. So I'm going to come back up to my navigator. And I'm going to turn off the mask overlay. And nothing's happened. So I haven't really changed anything with this man's hand. So maybe I want to make it a, a little lighter. And I'm going to make it a little warmer, because I think it's a little too blue. So just ever so slightly, just, just some nice little tweaks there. But the idea is that this is an irregular size, and so using the brush tool is, is perfect for it. So those are our tools. Um, what I did mention was that this has an erase function, uh, which is kind of handy. So let's look at this other, this other hand. We can just see the knuckles from it. Um, we're going to start a new brush. And that's new, because I don't want to adjust this brush. Right? So that one's active. So I'm going to hit the new. And I'm going to kind of work on his fingers here a little bit. Huh? And maybe I want to make those a little bit lighter. And if they're too light, let's make it too light so we can really see what we're doing here. You can see that I spilled over and I went beyond the boundaries of his knuckles. So that's where erase comes in handy. So if I just hit the erase button and I make this real small, then I can, I can erase the effect that I've created with the brush tool. And so now we're just looking at that modified area. So that, that's very handy. So not only can you get the irregular size, regular shapes, but then you can go back and you can fine tune it by getting rid of those edges. So I, I like that a lot. I think that's, that's real handy. So let's get out of our tools. And we've actually done quite a bit here in terms of working on stuff. Now let's start looking at the tone curve. So we're going to run down here to the tone curve. And this, this guy can get you in a lot of trouble. Let's switch photographs. Let's go to a parade. 
So while we're here, we have this horrible photo and the color is really bad and it needs some cropping. So let's, let's adjust the color. Let me pick a different color in there. How much I can do with that offhand? Okay. A little cropping. And instead of adjusting the exposure up here, this is where we're going to use the tone curve. And the tone curve is takes some mastering. And in all honesty, I don't think I've mastered it. So a little, a couple of little things that that's nice to do is one thing that the tone curve can do is to hit right in the midpoint. And this just shows you, you know, this is the whole gamut from black to white up here. And if we hit right in the middle and we drag this point up and down, it gives a nice even change in exposure for our photos. So it's a nice kind of gradual change. And then if we were to drag the bottom, we can also increase the contrast. And you can see that we're also um, clipping. You know, the guy's black pants are actually being clipped out. And let's turn that triangle off. So, so by grabbing this, we're adjusting the contrast of our photograph. And by dropping a pin right in the middle, we can adjust the exposure. And there's two different functions of the tone curve. And this one uh, is just the curve itself we're working on. It's, it's a custom curve. It's called the point curve. And if this little tool here, we click on it, now we, can, we have sliders. And these are going to affect the different parts of the curve. So if I want to adjust the, the shadows, you can see how it adjusts. That's the bottom part of the curve, not, not the top part. And if I adjust the, the lights, it's just affecting the top part of the curve. So this is a good way of fine tuning your exposure. And then I can notice that there's two different ways. One is here with the, um, with the sliders. And then the other one is custom. So you can drop points wherever you want and start to, to move the, the curve around. So if you can master the curve, you can really fine tune your photos that's the way you want them. The curve can also um, get you in trouble. It might just um, totally screw up your photo if it's not quite right. And the beauty is that you can always just right click and flatten the curve. Where have we heard that term before? So I, I like this. I like being able to adjust my, my, I use this in Photoshop a lot. I always do my adjustments, my exposure adjustments with my curve. Uh, in Photoshop. In Lightroom, I might use a slider, but I, I like the way that that looks. So let's try this. We're going to do the, there's an exposure adjustment using the curve. And we're going to flatten that. And now let's make an exposure adjustment using the slider. And how different are they? Well, we can tell by the going to our our history. So that's the slider and that's the curve. Slider, curve. And maybe I had done a little bit more with the slider. Now let's take a look at another tool. And here's where we can really control our colors. And this is in the HSL. And, and that stands for hue saturation and luminance. Let's switch over to a different photo. 
Let's look at this mushroom. So here's the mushroom. This is the original mushroom. Uh, it's taken in the woods. And it pretty much only has two major colors. So this yellow, orange, and green. So let's look at these sliders. Let's see what happens if I uh, play with the red slider. Um, not much. You know, I drag the sucker back and forth and nothing's happening. Orange. Now we're starting to get some effect. Yellow. Now we're getting some real effect. So, so this mushroom is predominantly orange and yellow. You're getting a lot of effects there. And you're going to find that, that when it comes to skin tones, orange tends to have more of an effect than the other colors. And then the other color that's predominant here, of course, is green. So if we punch up the green, we can see how much it comes up, or if we want to bring it down a little bit. You know, we might want to and we bring up the oranges and the yellows to make the mushroom stand out a little bit more and then desaturate the green somewhat. The other thing that we can do is change the, the darkness and brightness of it. That's the luminance. So if I want my greens to be darker, I can just drag this down a little bit. And so those mushrooms stand out even more so. And then here, here's a little trickier to play with. So what hue do I want my greens to be? Do I want them to be a green green or, or a yellow green? So the hue is, is definitely something that um, is a real fine tuning more so than the other two. And again, let's see how this changed compared to how we look. So we'll go into the comparison. And so there's our changes. The, the photo, uh, a little bit yellower and oranger, and the greens. Uh, okay. So we've made the greens real subtle. And we retain the, the color of the mushroom. And if we had just done that through saturation, uh, the greens would have changed equally in terms of uh, their, their saturation with the mushroom. So this gives us that selective ability, which is, I think, pretty handy. And so the last tool that I want to look at is the upright tool. And that's down here at the bottom. And that's called transform. Right? So what we want to do, and transforming is transforming the, the it's warping the photograph. And that comes in most handy when we're looking at buildings. So I just happen to have a building in here. And it's not uncommon to take a picture of a building and have it look like it's leaning backwards because our natural perspective, the one eye of the, of the camera is gonna, um, are gonna cause that converging lines. And so the upright tool allows us to correct for that. And, and the beauty of the upright tool is that uh, we can just hit auto. And, and automatically it looks for horizontal lines and vertical lines and, and tries to straighten them. Now this still has a little bit of an angle to it. So maybe we're going to want to adjust the vertical a little bit more. And so we come down to the vertical and we get grid lines right away. And if we look, you can see that this is just, it's not too bad, it's actually pretty close. But it looks like it's tilting back to me, so I'm just going to adjust my crop a little bit. Oh, wrong direction. So, so there we go. We're, we're bringing that in. 
and it's pretty horizontal. I don't think I have to worry about rotation too much. No, I, I could rotate it if I wanted to, but it looks pretty good in terms of rotation. And this is where the crop to image comes in. If you remember the crop to image checkbox up here in crop, and here for constraint to image, all we have to do is hit that and it automatically crops our photo and crops out the white part. So you can see how that white part um, is not an image anymore because we use transform. So that constraint to image is a companion to the upright tool. And you'll find using the upright tool, uh, I use it all the time because there's all, very often my my photos have a convergence that I'm not really happy about. I'll just make some adjustments to it. For the, we have an upcoming project, farms, bridges, and buildings. So the upright tool might come in pretty handy for, for that. So that's pretty much uh, all the tools. I mean, there's a, a lot more that we can work on, but I think what you want to do is to just find out what works best for you and, and just sort of touch on all these tools as you go along. And I, I find that I, I pretty much use them all, but I don't use them all on every picture. And of course, none of us do. Uh, as far as lens correction, I rarely use lens correction. I just kind of go with what I have. But I, I use all my tools. And, and I have a, a workflow, you know, that I go into, but it's not set in stone. And pretty much I'm just trying to get my pictures to look the way that I want them to. So that's the Lightroom developing module. Uh, there's a lot to it. And it takes, you know, a lot of practice. It can be a lot of fun working on. And, and I hope that you've enjoyed this presentation. Mm -hmm.